the celebration of two festivals signifying health and wealth the, the, the dhanvantri puja it's called dhanteras and then lakshmi puja we discussed both of them yesterday so let us continue the discussion today now the basic idea behind the celebration of diwali is that one incident is not what happens it is generally speaking whenever there is a major festival it is now I'm, I'm talking a little bit from the perspective of religious psychology and sociology before we go into uh, the specific scriptural and traditional understandings see anything that is significant if there's one thing that is of significance then other things they become attached to that say for example if somebody is drowning and a boat is passing by then people try to hold on to that boat people try to get into that boat if a boat is passing a boat is there in a stormy water and a ship is passing by and the boat tries to reach the ship so like that what applies in that domain also applies what applies in the domain of say in an ocean it also applies to human psychology see when we we talk about significance so there are different things of different degrees of significance so for example this could be great significance something could be small significance something could be medium significance and now when you talk about the significance of something what determines the significance we could say the significance is determined by many factors the significance is determined by the past and is determined by the present the past means how important what is the history behind it what is the associated with it but an incident may be very very important but if in the present nobody is celebrating it it doesn't have much significance i gave yesterday the example of bhadra purnima you know that was not celebrated so long uh, for quite some time since the start of his call but recently it started is quite a lot of significance so the significance comes from both the past history now his as well as the present practice so now the um, in diwali it's uh, at one level in any festival when there is celebration there is the cultural side and there is the philosophical side this is generally there in any anything spiritual anything traditional so raja vidya and pratyaksha avagama as krishna says 9.2 so now for most people the cultural is what is most important the philosophy is something which is in the background so in some ways you could say that the cultural it you can term is like the technological and the philosophy is like science not many people know the science of how the internet actually works but millions and billions of people use the internet so like that the cultural is what reaches the people the philosophical is not something which most people are aware of just as most people don't know the science behind how something works so basically now if you consider from the diwali perspective from the cultural perspective there is basically four things fun food firecrackers <laughs> so and of course there is family people come together various reasons but uh, at one level this is what the festival is about almost everybody wants to have some fun now the fun i'm not using necessarily in the cheap sense you can have fun in a satvik way rajasik way tamasik way whatever it is but the idea is in most occasions for for if we are if we look at ourselves if we have celebrated diwali in our childhood what is our childhood memory 
you know, it might be associated with some firecrackers that were blown or some food that was eaten or something which was done cultural, uh, culturally together. Even if we consider the the puja and the worship, okay, I, I, wo I woke up early in the morning and I took a bath and then we cleaned our house. So generally speaking, can you just take out the other ones also? So generally speaking, it's the cultural that is remembered. And the cultural, to some extent, while it is associated with the tradition, the cultural, to some extent, keeps changing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because culture itself keeps changing. Mm -hmm. So as the culture keeps changing, the cultural aspects will also change. Doesn't, that doesn't mean everything has to change. But some things do change. So I'll come back to the culture a little bit later and say. Now the philosophical, it is associated with the history. Now, often in the secular world, the word secular world, the word that is used is mythology. Now, many of us are uncomfortable with the word mythology because it conveys the idea of something being non-historical something being imaginary. So while there is definitely that concern, but if we consider a spectrum, say history and myth, so or let's not, let's put history and fantasy. So history is generally about what actually happened. Then in between, there are two words, the leg legend and myth. So mythology does not necessarily mean that it is non-historical. The idea is that it is historical plus something more. Mm. So generally, even the word leg legend also, we have heard the word legendary. So legend also is history plus some ornamentation, some poetic ornamentation. Say, generally speaking, the tendency of most people or most cultures is to, is to anoint, to decorate, to uh, talk about their past in ways that are far greater than what actually it is. So I was just in Australia some time ago. There is this whole legend in Australia about how Australia and New Zealand, their warrior, the soldiers fought in the Second World War. And there are many memorials. And I said they were very heroic and they played a decisive role. But actually speaking, if you look at the history, what the Australian and the New Zealand soldiers did was very, very little. Mm -hmm. The war practically hardly reached Australia. It didn't reach New Zealand, Second World War I'm talking about. But there's a legend that comes. Legend is history plus something. So for example, India, there is a story of Prithviraj Chauhan who fought 14 times and 14 times or 18 times or 16 times, whatever, he defeated uh, Ibrahim Lodi and finally he was Guri or Ibrahim Guri and he was defeated. And now if you look at the history, there are only two wars that we have objective historical evidence for. And is it possible there could be more wars? The, the two main wars that are recorded is between with just one year difference. First war he defeated and second war he was defeated. But the legend is where something is told, but that image becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So, in our tradition also when devotees write books about Prabhupada, you know, it, is, it is important that we don't mythologize Prabhupada. Prabhupada's actual life history is still glorious. But many times something is attributed to Prabhupada that is much more than what it is. So once one devotee told Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, there is some devotee saying he came to meet you and uh, you were cl in closed eyes, you were, doing, you, you were in some absorption and you started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the devotee just saw you stand, you offered his obeisance, just came out of the room. And Prabhupada just uh, laughed and just see. And Prabhupada basically mocked it. So. So the idea is that legends are what, they may not be out of, say, fantasy. They are not imaginary, but it's more like imagined respect. Out of wanting to respect something, we add imagination to what is told. 
So that's where it's legend. Now in myth also there is ornamentation, but there is one more thing is supernatural elements are added to it. So supernatural elements could be there is the idea of heavens, of earth. Like if you see in the history of India, every temple deity, which is then medieval deities, you have stories of those deities being protected from, say, Islamic invaders. Every, practically every temple has some story associated with it. Now, if all those stories were true, what it would mean was practically no temple was ever desecrated. And all Muslim invaders would be filled with memories of how powerful and extraordinary these deities are and they would be living in fear of the deities. But that is not the history. So, that is, so mythology is where some supernatural elements are added to it. Now, can the supernatural intervene? Of course it can intervene. We have the understanding that the avatars are there and there are various miraculous, there are vibhut, there are various uh, siddhis are there. The Lord can do extraordinary things. So, with the, when somebody uses the word mythology, we don't have to react to it. This is not mythology. Because that is the word that is used where people are, okay, there is history, but there is some supernatural element in it. Is the supernatural actual, not actual? Well, scientifically, we can't really verify that. Like, like one of the events here is Govardhan Puja. We'll come to that quickly, but just a quick point. See, what can history tell us? There is only a certain amount of things that history can tell us. See, history can tell us about things that happened. Hmm? But history cannot tell us about the identity of who, what happened. So by history, we can prove more or less now that a person named Krishna existed. But that Krishna was God. That cannot be proved to any historical research. In the Western tradition also, Jesus' identity is considered semi-human, semi-divine. The his that Jesus existed can be proven, but that he was he was semi-human, semi-divine, that cannot be proven. So anyway, the point is, I don't want to go to the philosophical side. The mythology is something which is the word we don't have to recoil against that. That that word is used in a particular sense. It is not to say that it is not history, but it is history plus something more. And a legend is history plus a little something more, which is possible, but un improbable. Hmm. But something which is involving supernatural elements is where mythology comes in. So let's look at it from this perspective now. Now if we move forward, <clears throat> yesterday I was talking about Lakshmi Puja. So I just talk a couple of things about that. See one of the distinctive aspects of the Vedic tradition is that there is a the divinity is seen as a divine couple. That is not just one person. God is not just male. God is both male and female. There are two aspects. <coughs> and uh, different aspects of divinity or different manifestations of deities are associated with different particular devtas or different particular aspects of the universe. So, Lakshmi is of course associated with wealth. Now, what was the Prabhupada's main concern when he talked about Lakshmi Puja? Sorry? Yes, Lakshmi is worship without Narayan. Now, in general, in the tradition of the worship of the goddess, there is the goddess is sometimes generally worshipped together with her husband and sometimes she is worshipped single. So this is more in the Shaivite tradition. In the Shaivite tradition, there is Durga, who is, or you could call it more specifically Parvati. She is almost always with Lord Shiva. Hmm? And Kali is almost always worshipped alone. Now, both of them may be generically used by the name Dur uh, Durga. But generally Parvati, so she, when the goddess is alone, she is said to be Saumya. That she is supposed to be in a gentle mood. Mm. When she is alone, she becomes in a Ugra mood. So Kali is generally, well, she can also give blessings, but the Kali is generally depicted as a fierce goddess. So the idea is that 
when the goddess is alone then she takes on the ro role of the protector because the lord who is the protector is not there so this is more in the shaivite tradition now from the shaivite tradition that particular idea had gradually came in the vaishnavite tradition also so normally lakshmi narayan are always worshiped together but and in the iconography also lakshmi and narayan are always together but over a period of time what started happening was that but in some ways in our tradition also the shakti tattva all the goddesses are considered to be expansions of one particular tattva so just like kali is worshiped separately so lakshmi also started getting worshiped separately now lakshmi is indeed the goddess of wealth at the same time she is with her lord narayan so there is <clears throat> when the lakshmi puja is done it, there is basically when somebody does lakshmi puja what is their conception in doing it the conception that people have that is generally speaking when we talk about the wealth is what we are people are seeking so wealth is the only or the supreme goal like in our tradition there is artha and then there is paramartha paramartha is the ultimate wealth the ultimate meaning the ultimate value so within the universal structure wealth is one aspect like lord ganesh is in charge of removing obstacles so we worship that ganesh was worshiped traditionally so that when you are studying something new vigna nashak that could be done but that is not the only thing there are many other things after we remove obstacles then there are many other things which are done needed to continue things so what happens is sometimes one the god one deity can be worship fragmented from the entire framework so what happens is if we see wealth as one among many blessings then it is narayan mukti pradata vishnu sarvesham itnu samshay as the as the upanishad say that as the purana say basically so what happens is there is a paramartha and here this narayan is the person who can actually give paramartha and then when laksh when artha and paramartha are integrated together then there is all round well being otherwise so lakshmi is said to be chanchala so we may worship her and we may appease her but lakshmi does not stay forever so the idea is why does lakshmi not stay forever sometimes we may say that oh is it lakshmi sometimes what happens is certain things are attributed to certain deities now lakshmi is the goddess of fortune to call her chanchala it can almost seem like an insult to the goddess and then it she is fickle so like where does the word where is the word chanchala used in the bhagavad gita <laughs> chanchala mana krishna that the mind is fickle so to say that lakshmi is fickle you know in many ways the word fickle could be associated with somebody who is not committed somebody who is not steady some and it could also be associated with unchaste like if somebody is fickle say in a particular relationship then they will leave that relationship to go to somewhere else so when the word chanchala is used it is not used of, although it has become attributed to lakshmi what it is meant actually is that the blessings of lakshmi are chanchala and why what when this we say chanchala chanchala can mean restless at one level restless means as we say fickle but chanchala also with when it is applied for the mind it means fickle but chanchala also means unpredictable so that we cannot it almost in unpredictable or arbitrary arbitrary in the sense that now two people invest money in some stocks one person gets a lot of money million 1000 people buy a lottery one person wins the lottery 
Now, from this life's perspective, it does seem arbitrary. So, in that sense, <coughs> there is when it's applied to Lakshmi specifically to Lakshmi's blessings, it refers to the arbitrary or the unpredictable aspect, not the restless or the fickle aspect. So now, from the symbolic significance perspective, now from our experience, it is true that Lakshmi doesn't last for very long. So the wealthiest dynasties may end up becoming uh, very poor. According to if you study history, Rajasthan, which is like a desert now, that is the place from which Saraswati River was supposed to be flowing. And just a few thousand years ago. So things keep changing with time. And even it could be countries, it could be families, it could be individuals. Their fortunes keep changing. So it is only beyond this world that there is everlasting fortune. That's why Lakshmi and Narayan are generally to be worshipped together. Now, of course, within the tradition, there is Lakshmi and Narayan together also because there are festivals associated with Narayan also. So that is with respect to Ram and with respect to Krishna. Now, with respect to Ram, which is the festival associated over here? Yeah, but which is the incident? Sorry? Yes, the return to Ayodhya. Now, generally, the lambs that are there, they are associated with this particular idea. So, when Lord Ram came back, now if we look at the original Valmiki Ramayana, what is described is that there was a great celebration when Lord Ram came back. That the celebration was such that Lord Ram first came to Nandigram. He did not come to uh, Ayodhya specifically. Nandigram is on the outskirts of, of Ayodhya where Bharat was residing. And there Bharat had got practically all the leading citizens of Ayodhya to welcome Lord Ram. And there the celebration, the joy went on so much. After, after reunion, after a long separation, a long and a painful separation, that by the time from Nandigram they came to Ayodhya, it became twilight, it became night. And that's how these lambs became associated. So at one level, the lambs, I just talked about there is a specific and a symbolic idea about it. So specific was more to welcome welcome the Lord. And now at a symbolic level, it has become a sign of celebration. Generally, darkness is not very pleasant unless somebody wants to do something unpleasant. Isn't it? <laughs> if somebody wants to rob, somebody wants to attack, then darkness is a like a pleasant surprise for you. You can get away with it. But generally, darkness is not favorable for doing things. So, light symbolizes celebration. Now, the Diya as a tradition, in the Vaishnava tradition, what has happened is, in, specifically in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, the <coughs> Damodar Leela is what is emphasis. In Krishna Leela, there are two main events, events that happen. Actually, three. Which are associated with Diwali. Which are the three? Yes, Govardhan Puja, Annapur festival, then sorry, Damodar Leela, then well, Teras is mainly associated with Dhanvantri. Okay, this is actually, yeah, you could put it that way. This is Narakshatu Dashi. Now, this we don't celebrate so much. This is more associated with the killing of Narakasur by Krishna. So, now beyond that, there is one more avatar, Vamana. What is associated with him? There is the Bali Pratipada. Bali is, who is Bali? Is a Bali Maharaj. So, Bali Pratipada is Bali surrendering to Vamande. 
So that is also associated with this particular festival. So there's a lot of associations with, as I said, Vishnu Narayan. So the worship of Lakshmi in that sense is not divorced in the tradition itself. So in the conception of people, they might just worship Lakshmi alone. But actually within the tradition, there's Lakshmi and Narayan. They're both there through different festivals. But ideally, in the same celebration, Lakshmi and Narayan, both being together is good. So now, if we look at Govardhan Puja, we will be talking about that more. So I won't go into too much about that right now. But <coughs> the idea is that when we talk about, generally when people talk about Diwali, they have the association of food with it, prepare a lot of faral items, feasts, and then eat it, share it, distribute it, give it to uh, it is. So the idea is that it is associated in general with the festivities. In Govardhan Puja, it is associated specifically with, the, with Krishna doing the Puja. So in many ways, in the, if you see these different festivities, in Ram Leela, like the battle or the confrontation happens before the festival. So in, that the welcoming of the Lord means Ravan has already been killed. But in Govardhan Puja, the confrontation will come afterwards. So what is happening is, the when the Govardhan Puja happens, at that time they worship Govardhan and then the food is distributed. So now when we do Govardhan Puja, which is the day, this is not the day that after this Indra will do his rains for seven days. Hmm. So the rains were also completely unseasonal if we consider the Indian context. This time there are not many rains, not much rains. So what we celebrate is so in one sense, sometimes the celebration comes after the Lord has done something marvelous. Sometimes the celebration comes and after that the Lord does something marvelous. But before the Lord does something marvelous, something not so marvelous also happens. Like the Vrajivasis, they are, they are terrified what has happened over here. And now they don't know specifically how the Lord is going to protect. So in one sense, the celebration of the return of Ayodhya, the return to Ayodhya is like the triumph of faith. Triumph of faith means that Lord Ram is the Supreme Lord. The Lord will win over demons. And so the Lord has in fact won over demons. Whereas Govardhan Puja, it's more like a show or a test of faith. That the Lord says, no need to worship Govardhan. So no need to worship Indra, you can worship Govardhan instead. And when the Brajavasis do that, it's like they know that this is going to create some trouble. But they are ready to do that. So in some ways, Krishna provokes people. And what happens is like a doctor, suppose a patient is sick and the patient is in denial that I am sick. Then the doctor may give some medicine which initially aggravates the sickness. And then, the, hey, what is happening? I, I, my cough is increasing, the swelling is increasing, this discomfort is pain. Oh, doctor, please help me. So what happens is sometimes the symptoms need to be aggravated so that the person confronts reality. So Indra had pride, arrogance, entitlement within him and Krishna detected that. But then Krishna deliberately provoked him. Hmm? And the way he provoked also was, was it's, it's a whole different pastime, but the Vrajavasi's faith is what we are talking about. So celebration, so what happens is Krishna says, there is no need to worship Indra. So imagine some big person say some political dignity the chief minister of, my, uh, of a state or a mayor or the prime minister they are supposed to be invited as a chief guest for a, some big occasion and then suddenly their invitation is cancelled now generally speaking the chief guest will cancel i am coming those who are festival organizers would cancel the chief guest and they cancel the chief guest and replace that with some unknown local person <laughs> it's like Indra Puja was given up and after that whose Puja? One hills Puja. 
think that I am replaceable for somebody who is proud that I am replaceable. That itself is infuriating. But I am replaced by this. <laughs> that becomes unbearable to the ego. And then just uh, so he tries to destroy the Rajivasis and Krishna will expertly use the very thing that replaced Indra to defy Indra. Krishna could have stopped Indra in many ways but Krishna uses Govardhan. So the point is that here that's the whole story of the future but here Krishna is provoking and the Vrajavasis are going along and being a part of that. So it's like we are celebrating because something some very difficult test is over, difficult phase is over and there is success. But here Govardhan Puja is actually, we are celebrating knowing that some difficult test is coming now. So it's a different kind of celebration. It's like a celebration after the war is won and a celebration before the war is going to happen. It's like the last meal that warriors take before they go for a fight. <laughs> you know, you don't know what is going to happen. So eat as much, enjoy the food now. You don't know what you will get to eat. <laughs> so there are. So the idea is that faith can be expressed in different ways. So Govardhan Puja is more like a and the, the, the celebration and act of faith over there is faith in the face of danger that is coming, not danger that has gone. Now, of course, if you consider Damodar Leela, the same dynamic is there with Damodar Leela that it's a beautiful festival where Mother Ishuda ties Krishna. In fact, the entire Damodar Leela happens in one, part, one day itself, most of it. But uh, the idea is that Krishna gets tied over here, that the Lord is conquered. So this is more about the devotee being greater than the Lord. Other festivals are mostly about the devotee being protected by the Lord. Hmm. So in that sense, if you see, among all these festivals, now if you see Govardhan Puja also, the idea that devotee is greater than the Lord is that it is Krishna also worships Govardhan. Krishna also, uh, it doesn't directly protect, Krishna says, oh Govardhan has protected you. In fact, when Mother Ishwara says, Krishna, how are you lifting Govardhan? He says, no, actually Govardhan is ecstatic, he is himself floating up. <laughs> and I am just using my finger for for this show. Then the mother says, remove the finger then. And then all those says, no, no, don't remove the finger. <laughs> but the idea is that in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, generally the mood is not so much of the Lord protecting the devotee as the Lord being conquered by the devotee. That Aishwarya Shithila Prema Na Ishwarya Re Bhujai. That's what Chaitanya Tamud says. So among the various festivities in our particular tradition, you see the festivals that are emphasized are what are more in alignment with the specific mood of the Gaudiya tradition. The mood is not just that the, the Lord is up there, the Lord is supreme, the Lord will protect us, but that actually the devotion of the devotee conquers the heart of the Lord. Ajita jito piyasita istrilokyam. So both these pastimes, the Govardhan Leela, especially in the in Vrindavan, many of the pastimes are very sweet and endearing. They are more in the Madhurya Bhav. When we use the word Madhurya, there are two aspects to it. Madhurya, there is a Bhav and there is a Rasa. So Madhurya Rasa is specifically, say what the Gopis and Radharani have. But the Madhurya Bhav is in all of Raja. But that Madhurya Bhav is contrasted with the Aishwarya Bhav. Whereas the Madhurya Ras is contrasted with the other Rasas. Shanta Dasya Sakya Vatsalya. So this is an example of that Madhurya Bhav more than the Madhurya Rasa. <coughs> now beyond that, so these are what is emphasized in the Gaudiya tradition and we will come to, we will be celebrating these separately and we will be talking about it also on those particular occasions. Dhamadalila of course we Celebrate every day. Narakshatur Dashi is where Krishna delivers the world from the demon Narak. Now, Narakasur is the name of that person, 
Now that literally means that there was a demon named Narakasur, but also means that this was a person who was capable of creating Naraka on the earth. See, from the demon's perspective, they don't consider hell to be a bad thing. Because hell is the place where they rule. And for them, oh, you know, he has created hell on earth. That is a glorification. <laughs> because hell is where they rule. So, <laughs> so the idea is that <coughs> Narakasur, he is a terrible demon and he has abducted many, many princesses. And his plan was that he wanted to perform a yagya at a particular end. He wanted, and after the yagya, for that he wanted these princesses to be virgin. And then after that, he was going to enjoy them for himself. So then the Lord comes and the Lord protects all of them, delivers the world from Narakasur and then he protects them. He delivers them. So then they all become his, his queens. That's how Krishna has 16,108 queens. They get the first eight queens and then the 16,000 queens. Now here Krishna is actually demonstrating again is more the Aishwarya Bhav his role as a protector. Paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya chadushkrita. So, the actual day on which Krishna killed this demon Narakasur is what is Narakasatudashi. Now, if you consider the Bali Pratipada that is there, this is a, again a very interesting pastime where the Lord does not come in the mode of a warrior. It's a, event is of a war, but the Lord comes more in the mode of a Bala Brahmachari. He's a Brahmachari is more a Brahminical mode. And what he does is he asks for charity. So Bali Pratipada is the time when Bali surrenders to the Lord. So if you see in one sense, the mood of Lakshmi Puja and Bali Pratipada is actually the opposite. Lakshmi Puja is we are asking things from the deity. Here Bali Pradapada is, in one sense, the one is, he surrenders, and how does he surrender? By giving everything. Now, apparently here, the Lord is unfair. The Lord says, I just want three steps. And it's like, uh, you know, the way the Lord, in one sense, cheats you. Now, we say we are in a car signal. And... Somebody beggar knocks and this knocks, ache. So, ache. So, we, yeah, we, we open the door, we want to give ache rupaya. I say, I think ache did the dome. I say, ache car did the upper car did the So, oh, will this is him, but can you ask me a park? I'll put you in How dare you ask for something like that? But the Lord asks for three steps. And three steps, he expands himself. What the word three means is, he takes everything. So now Bali Maharaj, it is not just a surrender. The Bhagavatam as it moves forward, it's like his surrender. It is all the more glorious because the Lord is seemingly unfair. See, so generally speaking, when we worship God, the normal way of transaction is people think that you give some donation to God, God will give that hundred times or thousand times more to you. So you will basically be the benefiter in that. But here the Lord asks for something small and takes everything from him. And not only does Bali not resent it, when his assistants, they become angry and they say this is unfair and they want to attack. Now he stops them and he gracefully accepts. So it's like when the faith, when the, when the Lord does something good to us, that, that time faith is very easy to have. Mm -hmm. But when something bad happens, at that time faith is very difficult. But it's not just something bad, when something unfairly bad happens, 
Now that is very difficult to bear. It's like you know, if there is a COVID and everybody is sick. Okay, misery loves company, so we are all sick. But it's like everybody is healthy and I only get fever. You know, why is this happening? So actually that time the faith is tested the most. When we seem to be singled out for suffering by the Lord. In spite of what we are not, in spite of what we have done or not done for the Lord. So surrender at that time is very difficult. And it is that surrender that is commemorated. Now there are a few other stories also. There is this Hanuman Puja that is there with the legend that when, when Lord Ram came back to Ayodhya, at that time he remembering and appreciating the service that Lord Ram did to him, that Hanuman did to him, he said Hanuman should be worshipped first. Hanuman should be welcomed. So then there is also <clears throat> the Vishwakarma Puja. Then there is where an artist is, like I said, there's something of big significance and other things get attached to it. So there are artisans who worship their tools. They say that there's a gift of a Vishwakarma, the god of everything artistic. Then there is some Yama Puja that is there. It is to ward of death. Then a major festival is Bhai Doj. It's not so much of uh, like religious significance as more of historical significance. <coughs> so I said festivals in the celebrated, how much they are in the past and how much they are in the present. So in the past in terms of history, in terms of religious history or what the modern world called mythology, Baobij doesn't have that much of significance. The significant story that is associated is that Yama comes to meet um, his sister Yamuna and she welcomes him, she greets him and so similarly it is said that the Yama and Yam, Yama, Yamraja and Yamuna they are brothers and sisters so like that there is a festival where brothers and sisters so this is almost the uh, counterpart of Raksha Bandhan. So there are many festivals associated with this. So I'll, uh, these are all supplementary festivals. I'll just make one last point about the culture and then we'll conclude this. I mentioned that in the culture what happens there are different things which become associated with particular forms of worship. So now in today's Diwali culture, firecrackers have become like the major part of the celebration. Now historically speaking, among these festivals, among each of these occasions, if you look at whatever description is available traditionally, Firecrackers have never been prominent. When Lord Ram comes, yes, there is a description of the festival and might someone have celebrated with firecrackers? They may have, but it is not something very prominent. So, uh, now of course, food is generally, there is, there may be fasting and there may be feasting. Sometimes both happen one after another. In some occasions, more of feasting. So, Many people like Diwali because there is practically no fasting, there is only feasting over here. <laughs> so other festivals, you have to fast before we get to the feast. Hmm? But uh, here it's now, I, so I'll just talk a couple of things about the firecrackers. So certain things may become very prominent. Now when they become prominent at particular times. Now, if you see one of the questions that Arjun, that uh, Krishna asked the Brajavasis, he says when the Indra Puja is going on, he says, is this scriptural or is it traditional? It's a very interesting question. Scriptural means, is this based on Shastra? Traditional means, is this something which is coming down from the past? So everything that comes down from the past is not necessarily traditional. Is that true? No, everything comes from the past is traditional. But everything traditional may not be scriptural. So if a traditional is one circle, scriptural is another circle. So that there may be many things given in scripture that are not being practiced now. And there are many things which are in the tradition that are being practiced now, which are not traditional. So, you know, it's a deviation can come from the tradition also. 
it's not the deviation comes from the contemporary world alone like the caste system or the caste by birth idea that is a deviation that has come from the tradition so it is not by that we can say just by doing what was done in the past we'll be faithful we might be faithful to a deviation that has come from the past instead of being faithful to what actually was the essence of the tradition now i'm not making this as a judgment about whether firecrackers are positive or negative that are there deviation just because something is not explicitly mentioned in the scripture does not necessarily make it a deviation because things can be added so for example in the raksha bandhan generally we think it's more of a conventional festival rather than a scriptural festival there is some association of draupadi and krishna with it but the mood of draupadi and krishna is not of a brother and a sister it's not exactly madhurya but it's not exactly brother and sister also it's like quite a unique rasa but it is described in the goswami literature in the anand navan champu and gopal champu there are some passages where it is said that the the gopis and krishna that basically in vrindavan among the various festival that would happen rakshabandhan is also one of the like tying of strings was there how does that refer to rakshabandhan not necessarily so some people say that that is the justification if someone wants to celebrate rakshabandhan there is nothing wrong with that so when something is coming in the tradition now i am not talking about the gaudiya vaishnava tradition as we are practicing here but something is coming in the tradition now how much do we emphasize it so that will based on ultimately we have to consider in bhakti what is anukul and what is pratikul so what is anukulya sankalpa pratikulya varjanam what is favorable what is unfavorable so are fire for crackers favorable for bhakti are they unfavorable for bhakti now how do we decide what is anukul pratikul at one level we can look at shastra at what it says but another level is we can look at what is the effect is it sattva rajas or tamas hmm. so in some cases the firecrackers may contribute to the mood of the festival and celebration of the festival and if that is happening then that is fine if somebody wants to celebrate it and it enhances the mood that is okay but the important thing is sometimes certain things become become they are a part of a tradition but they also become instruments of a political war so there are some attempts to say that oh this firecrackers cause so much pollution and therefore we should not have these firecrackers some states are trying to ban the firecrackers and some see this this is this is infringement on hindu rights to celebrate their festivals so at such times when we make a statement you know we may be making a statement from the spiritual perspective but we are entering into political mind field so if we consider other places like there is in our tradition there is only the nitya worship that is there but naimittika worship is also described like we have ganesh puja where they have ganesh visarjan they do so now they do the visarjan in our, our tradition is aro arohan and tirobhav use so that naimittik puja and nitya puja that is very much a part of the broad idea of worship of deities but there they have adopted as it is possible ganesh deities they are made more eco friendly and then when they go into the water also it doesn't destroy the water it doesn't harm the water so now sometimes some people do it some people don't do it the idea is that when certain things are going on rather than stepping into a what has become a political battlefield with particular positions the important thing is firecrackers it is something which is a part of the tradition but quite often it the effect for most people will be more rajasik and tamasik than satvik now it depends <coughs> on what someone is remembering so this is the principle i'll conclude with like anukulya sankalpa pratikulya varjanam ultimately it is a matter of the remembrance of the law if we consider music now there is something called mantra rock hmm? like people 
have the Hare Krishna mantra sung with uh, rock music. And there are devotees who will do that and a lot of people who come for that. Now, is that good? Is that bad? Yesterday, I remember about intent, content and consequence. So, if we consider here, it is in content, it is, it is the, it, there is the Krishna mantra is there. And there is also something which is not normally there from the tradition. So then here we have to look at what Prabhupada says, Fala, Falena Parichayati. So for somebody who is familiar with mantras, hmm, what happens with them? For them, what they remember, what is new is the rock. So at the end of the event, what they will remember is the rock. And that will not make their devotion rock. And it, will, it will only create new impressions. On the other hand, if somebody is familiar with rock, hmm, and for them the mantra is the new thing, then they may remember the mantra. So for them, the same thing might be anukud. Because, okay, there is some familiar genre of music in which something new is being done. Hmm? So the new is what is remembered. So it's not black and white. That for some people it might be favorable, for some people it might be unfavorable. Now of course, we are not going to have mantra rock in our temples and certainly not in Mangalarti. You know, if somebody does that, that will be a, a mangal. <laughs> it won't be mangal at all. So there are certain boundaries are definitely in the black and white. There is. Now there are shades of grey. So for particular purposes, certain things are required. Falina Parichayati. So now for some people, firecrackers may be mentally very strongly associated with Diwali. And they say, oh, you stop firecrackers, you are. You are infringing on what is the traditional festival of Diwali. If somebody is very emotionally invested in something, okay. That, that's what is reminding them. And that's fair enough. But for others who are not so emotionally invested, now we see generally it involves a lot of expenditure of money, it involves a lot of uh, pollution, it involves a lot of danger. Uh, there is hazard available, Haz hazards are there, fire hazards. So, um, this car I have is actually a gift of firecracker gone wrong. So, the idea is that there are dangers over there. So, it's important that we consider Deshikala Patra. And we don't choose fights that are not necessary. So there are battles which are necessary. The battles that are necessary is that in festivals, the Lord be remembered. The specific cultural aspects, if those favor, assist in the remembrance of the Lord, then they can be emphasized. If they are not assisting in the remembrance of the Lord, then they needn't be emphasized because ultimately, Sarva Vidhi Nishedasur, the purpose of all, all factors, all uh, practices, all formularies is ultimately to remember Krishna and to never forget Krishna. That applies to the tradition, that applies also to the culture. So, I can summarize what we discussed today. In the significance of Diwali, I started by first discussing about the spectrum of uh, on one side is history, on other side is fantasy and in between is legend where there is something which is uh, added which is possible but improbable and some heroic deeds are added and myth is where something supernatural is added. So, in general, mythological does not mean fantastical or imaginary. It often means there is a, there is a um, difficult to determine blend of history and something more than history. In it. So, in general, whenever any festival is celebrated, the celebration of the festival, uh, uh, it depends on the significance is what was done in the past and what, how important is it in the present. So something which is of great significance, things of smaller significance get added to it. So, <coughs> so like that in Diwali, there is a central theme.
theme, but many other celebrations have become added to it. So within the celebrations, so I discussed about or occasions. We discussed various occasions. We talked about the worship of the goddess Lakshmi Puja, as you know, we can have Artha and we have Paramartha. So Artha and Paramartha can be linked, and that is the best if they are fragmented. And one pursues Artha, one pursues wealth, but one neglects the Paramartha. So Lakshmi Puja is more associated with Artha, but within the tradition itself. With the Paramartha, there is much that is associated with Lord Vishnu also. And then we discussed, there are three broad manifestations of the Lord with respect to Lord Ram, Krishna and then Vamana. And with respect to Lord Ram, it is his return to Dwarka. So it is like the triumph after the test. Hmm? That is the welcoming of Lord Ram to Ay Ayodhya. Whereas with Krishna Leela, there are three incidents. There is the Govardhan Leela, there is the Damodar Leela and there is the Narkasur, which is the... Now Govardhan Leela is, we discuss especially, it is the celebration that is going to lead to the test. Not just before the test, the celebration is going to cause the test. That replacing Indra Puja with Govardhan Puja is what the Govardhan are doing. So it is a big show of their faith, even in the face of danger. And the Amodar Leela, these two are celebrated because they are the Gaudiya Vaishnava mood. Is that actually even the devotee, the devotee becomes greater than the Lord and says the Lord subordinates himself to the devotee. That Aishwarya, Aishwarya Bhav is lowered. In Arkasur Leela, there is the Lord as the protector, conventionally, Paitrana, Sadhana, Vinashya Dushkrita. And then Vaman Bali Pradipada is about. Surrender amid apparent unfairness. That is the most difficult form of surrender. But how Bali Maharaj gracefully accepts that. So in one sense, this mood is almost the opposite of the Lakshmi Puja. And there are some other aspects, some other festivals associated with Yama and others also that are there. And then with respect to the culture, I talk about a principle that when there are firecrackers, they have become a central part. So they are, they are traditional, but they are not necessarily scriptural. So now somebody can find some obscure reference from somewhere, but as far as the main literature is considered, there is no description and certainly the centrality is not there. So then how do we decide? We decide based on what is favorable and what is anukul, what is pratikul. And how do we decide what is Anikul or Pratikul? Two criteria for that. We look at Sattva Rajas Tamas in terms of what is being done. And how do we know what is Sattva Rajas Tamas? We look at the Fala. So Fala is in terms of remembrance. So for those whom the particular observance reminds them of the Lord very strongly, then that observance can be insisted on. But for those who are not so emotionally invested in that particular observance, then rather than fighting unnecessary battles, we focus on the remembrance of the Lord and how that can be best fostered. So thank you very much. Shri Krishna Bhagwan ki, Shri Diwali Mahamautsav ki, Vitae Gaur Premanandi. Thank you. Okay. Do you have time to one question? Yes, sir. Quickly. Hmm. Yeah, but it is not that uh, I'm not sure when Dasara was the day when Lord Ram was exiled. So whether the 14 years end on Dasara, there is no mention of that. Now specifically in the in Lanka, they did three things. One was, see Lord Ram was not a raider or a plunderer. Mm -hmm. That he did not want to plunder Lanka. So there was a war, there was a devastation. 
Lord Ram installed a person from there itself who knew the kingdom. That is Vibhishan. So he wanted Vibhishan to be uh, properly installed um, as a king so that the Lanka Vasis would also be taken care of. See, Lanka was not plundered. Lanka was not even annexed. Annexed means that you know you become a subordinate kingdom within us. Like this, he would give tributes. That Vibhishan would give tributes. Right? So that first thing was that happened. The celebration of uh, the installation or at least the of the taking care of Lanka's concerns and Lanka's citizens. And the, <coughs> the second was that after that they went to the, there's a union of Sita and Ram and then there is there are various things that happen over there that didn't take much time but when Lord Ram was coming back they came by Pushpa so it didn't take 15 days but while they were coming along Lord Ram said descend at Kishkinda and at Kishkinda they descended and Lord Ram said that for the Vanaras Vibhishan had given many gifts to the Vanaras but he said that you know you have fought so you deserve to be a part of the celebration. So in order the Vanaras, he said, come on Pushpak, but he got a Kishkinda, tell them that get your families also to come. So collecting them all took some time. And then after that, when Lord Ram came, he came to Bharadwaj Muni first. So basically along the way, there were stops. And that's how even, and when he came there also, another thing that happened was, when he was near Bharatvaj Muni's ashram, he said to Hanuman, go and check Bharat's mood. That does, has Bharat become attached to the kingdom? If he has, then I won't want to take the kingdom away from him. So then Ra Hanuman went and came back. So because of all these, there were some delays. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.